Good morning, everyone, uh, to this uh, second academic session um, here at CPDP. As you may know, uh, the academic sessions follow a slightly different format than the other panels. Uh, here we have uh, uh, paper presentations that are, at our fore, that are at the fore, and then we have Q&As uh, uh, with the authors of the papers. So the, the papers are all available uh, in real form, so you can contact the authors if you're interested in their paper and get a copy to, uh, to read at your leisure. Um, we're going to limit the introduction um, of the speakers and also of the entire panel to maximize the time available for presentation. So every author has provided contact details at the end of their presentation, so get in touch with them after the, the session. Okay, this um, uh, panel is called uh, the COVID-19 panel and CPDP, um, but COVID-19 is really sort of um, something that um, only superficially links all the papers together. So they're, they're quite varied and um, the tour of today will be that we will start with the paper that is closest to uh, CPDP, so privacy and data protection in COVID, um, and that is the paper um, written by Eiste uh, Geribaite, and um, she will talk about the Italian immune uh, application. And then we move on to how data collected through all sorts of means, including tracing apps, um, um, on uh, public deliberation and decision making in view uh, of the GDPR by Ludovica Passeri. Then we will broaden the horizon beyond data protection and look at how digital contact tracing has already led to population control and surveillance in China by Wan Xu Kong. And finally, um, Johannes Thunford uh, will talk about how COVID may have sounded the bell for the next stage in development of digital sovereignty. So let's start with um, our first speaker, uh, Eiste. And Eiste is a PhD student in the last JD um, right of Internet of Everything program, which is currently funded by the Maria Sklodovia Curie EU Action. Um, uh, all the speakers will have um, uh, 13, 14 minutes for their presentations, and then we have um, uh, um, a brief Q&A uh, on their uh, paper, and then move on to the next one. So, Eiste, the floor is yours, and go ahead. Um, good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, can we get the slides, please? Great. Um, so my presentation focuses on ensuring data protection rights and public safety in pandemics and lessons learned from the Italian Immuni app. Um, Italy in late February and March 2020 became the epicenter of COVID-19 pandemic outbreak in Europe and was one of the first countries in Europe to develop an exposure notification app. Our research examines the adoption of what we may call the first generation tool, an exposure alerting app Immuni used in Italy and its legal and technological impact to the fundamental freedoms which Europe has been striving to protect uh, the right to data protection and public safety. Uh, this presentation will delve into how personal data protection rights uh, and the collective dimension of such rights are being ensured through a technological prism and thus ensuring uh, public safety. Uh, through this analysis, we aim to shed light on how individual and collective rights are enforced in the changing and unpredictable world. Um, may we change the slides, please? Okay, great. Um, as a matter of background, Immune was developed by Bending Spoons under the supervision and in collaboration with um, the Extraordinary Commission for COVID-19 Emergency, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Innovation, Technology and D Digitalization in Italy and serves as an official exposure notification app for the state of Italy. The app has been developed in terms of the applicable legal basis established by Article 6 of the Law Decree Number 28 uh, um, of the year 2020. Um, which established a single national platform for the management of the COVID-19 alert system and specific requirements for such a system, which um, inter included creation of an app to achieve a specific purpose, the voluntary nature of the installation, the use of pseudo anonymized data, uh, transparency of processing and data subject rights, all reminiscencing the principles enshrined in the, uh, in the GDPR. In essence, Immune is an exposure notification app that works by notifying users at risk of carrying the virus at a very early stage, allowing them to self-isolate in order to avoid infecting others and seek medical advice. Um, in a situation where two users are sufficiently close to each other uh, for a period of time, their devices record each other's rolling identifier in local device memory. 
Uh, the app features an exposure notification system that leverages Bluetooth flow energy. And in case where one of the users tests positive for COVID-19, the user has the option um, to upload to a server its recent temporary exposure key. The app periodically downloads the new temporary exposure keys and matches the identifiers against those stored in the device's memory and notifies uh, users if they had an exposure with another infected user. Um, let's change the slide again. From a methodological point of view, we analyzed the guidelines on the user uh, use of location data and contact uh, tracing tools in the context of COVID-19 outbreak and guidelines on the processing of data concerning health for the purposes of scientific research uh, in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak and the data protection principles outlined therein in the specific example of a pneumonia app illustrating how the app conform with data protection principles through its design. Um, uh, let's move a slide again, please. Uh, we therefore, in our study, try to answer the following questions. Uh, what potentially vulnerable immunis app security errors can be identified? And how the app's developers addressed uh, the potential risks? We conducted a liter literature review and scanned the app through a community-established open-source mobile security tester Immuni web, and have identified the following uh, risk areas. First of all, risks associated with the use of DP3T instead of PPPT frameworks. The crucial difference between the two frameworks are the reporting mechanisms. The PPT uses a centralized approach as it requires users to upload contact uh, logs to a central reporting server, whereas DP3T does not have access to such data and is not responsible for the processing of contacts. Imone uses the decentralized approach. Um, it is crucial to note that the primary threat of the decentralized approach lies with the undetectable attacks on decentralized systems, which can be done at large scale um, as also discussed by Sergei Odenay in his work. In fact, it is only surprising, uh, it is not only surprising how many privacy threats from a technical perspective that the centralized approach creates, but also that the current privacy standards used within the framework may not be adequate as second reported users may be de-anonymized and tricked into revealing their private data. Uh, we further identified that the guy and API are more likely to be exposed to the so-called replay attacks. And lastly, there may be risks associated with information disclosure and uh, service disruption or alteration. Uh, we then went on analyzing uh, whether and to what extent such risks were identified and addressed by the develop developers of the app. Um, through the analysis of the documentation and information provided by the Italian Data Protection Authority Garant and the Immuni app and the GitHub open source code, excuse me, <coughs> open source code of the app, uh, with supporting documentation, we note that most risks were assessed by a number of privacy-preserving technology features installed in the app, including the minimization of permissions requested by the app, which is limited to two for iOS devices and one permission for Android devices. The use of uh, Bluetooth Low Energy technology, which allows to minimize the collection of Risk of replay attacks has been assessed as a minimum risk due to the difficulty to implement such an attack in practice at a large scale in order to have an impact. Um, the app also uses rolling proximity identifiers, which are generated from temporary exposure keys and change multiple times each hour. These temporary exposure keys are generated randomly and change once per day. Data at rest is also encrypted using advanced encryption standards. The AES decryption keys are stored in iOS specific native key storage database. And data in transit is also protected through HTTP, HTTPS protocols with transport layer security, which lever, leverages certain ciphers. Um, in order to avoid the so-called man-in-the-middle attack, Immuni performs strict uh, checks that leverage CA uh, pinning. Um, let's change the slide again, please. Um, the last question we attempted to address in the study uh, was what role does the Immune app play in ensuring public safety in an Italian COVID-19 uh, scenario in a broader sense? Usually philosophical and technological concepts presume that the world consists of cooperating and benevolent individuals who are willing to voluntarily help each other and the society. Yet a recent study by the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights on the coronavirus pandemic in the EU and its fundamental rights implications with a focus on contact tracing gaps um, found that only 23% of respondents uh, were not willing to share their personal data with public administration. And a 2019 OECD survey has shown that only 45% of the citizens trusted their governments. 
National states and sovereign governments have the crucial role to protect public safety, not only in ordinary circumstances, but also in times of crisis. Um, in order to be successful, the app had to be downloaded, installed and used by 60% of the population of smartphones, which success and effectiveness is still to be assessed. Um, we, we may observe that Timone attempts to achieve the goal of managing the spread of COVID-19 by incentivizing the use of, on, of information or data as it challenges the cultural and social fabric of the society, the way we communicate and interact with each other, and our civic responsibility towards each other. Uh, the app therefore tries to ensure data protection rights through ensuring the highest standards of security and privacy in the app itself, as we discussed earlier, and also attempts at ensuring group privacy through privacy preserving analytics, whereas aggregated data are collected and uploaded with it without any requirement for any users to authenticate themselves. Um, let's move to another slide, please. Um, we can draw some conclusions from what we had discussed. Firstly, it can be assessed that data protection principles were implemented throughout the whole design, development and deployment stages of the app, yet the effectiveness and success of the app uh, are still to be addressed. We must note, however, that a positive indication towards the success of Imone is the fact that uh, Imone was one of the first European apps to be interconnected through a pan-European interoperability framework in late 2020. Um, while trust may be one of the fundamental challenges when it comes to public uses, usage of um, such exposure notification app, uh, one must also account for the social and psychological behavior of the data subject uh, during times of emergency, which may contribute to the effectiveness of the app as well. Um, also, we, may, uh, we, we must observe that there is no clear cut distinction between the centralized and decentralized models as all proposals based on one or the other framework have a central component which plays a smaller role in the DP3T model and takes a more relevant play in the PPT uh, model. Finally, we also should acknowledge that contact tracing apps such as Simone uh, form part of the nationwide healthcare plan to fight COVID-19 and are not the essential part of the healthcare plan. Rather, it is a supplementary tool used on a voluntary basis which allows to express one civic duty towards um, each other. Uh, thank you, and I leave some time for questions and the further discussion. Thank you, uh, Eister. Um, uh, we have plenty of time for, for questions, actually, because you um, you were a bit fast and uh, the presentation was mm -hmm. packed with, um, with the information. Um, the topic of your presentation is, is, is very interesting. I mean, uh, COVID tracing apps are a thing in many countries around the globe, and, and we all know that there are many uh, privacy and data protection issues related to these apps. And uh, mm -hmm. Italy being one of the first to, uh, to implement one is, uh, is, is in, in, indeed at the forefront there. I can imagine that we have uh, many people um, in the audience uh, that are uh, aware or familiar with the various um, contact tracing apps. So let's see if, um, if, if there are um, uh, questions from, from the audience. Um, in the meantime, uh, because there is a slight delay in the, in the questions coming through to the, uh, through the chat, um, let me uh, start uh, maybe with a, with a question. So, do you have um, data on the uh, the adoption rate of the uh, of the app in Italy? So you you, you mentioned, and this is an, uh, an often cited number, sixty percent um, from mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, uh, an app has been launched in the Netherlands, and I think it's not very successful. And I think that is the uh, uh, sort of the the finding across the board. Um, can you can you say a bit more about that in Italy? Um, yes, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me again, just to confirm because I seem to have lost a bit of connection. Great, so um, it's true, the adoption of the app is, uh, of the contact tracing apps or actual exposure notification apps is not as, uh, as big as one would have expected, I think, also um, seen by the government. So at the moment, Italy has not reached the percentage, the 60% as they say. I believe the number last time I checked was at 10 million um, and it's growing, but it's, it is a very slow adoption considering that the app was launched, um, I believe in July now, so. Yeah, so um, um, people had high hopes of uh, of these tracing apps, um, let's say in, in, mm -hmm. in April, May last year. and. 
somehow um, sort of the enthusiasm of, of, uh, of, of these kind of tracing applications uh, as a means to, uh, to quickly isolate people who might be um, mm -hmm. uh, infected um, has, has declined a little bit. Is, is that your, your impression as well in, in Italy? Uh, yes, it definitely has declined. Um, I think the fact that uh, Immune tries to incentivize the using of data through changing the way people interact with each other um, is harder to implement in practice because it's also a very big, very big cultural change here in Italy. Um, the same if you compare, for example, Italy has recently launched a cashback uh, program to incentivize the use uh, um, for economic uh, purposes. Um, people had to share incredible amounts of personal data um, to receive the cashback and that uh, app was uh, downloaded within the first few hours has crashed basically. So the incentive incentification um, is much greater when it's used for economic means and it works better rather than when it's uh, used for social means um, like Kimono, which is voluntarily based. So yeah, definitely. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any questions uh, appearing in the chat. Um, is that me or are people... I don't see anything coming. Um, okay. Um, what is... Um, yeah, maybe maybe the other panelists, because they, they're all aware of, of the COVID tracing apps, maybe they have um, questions that they can, can field to... Um, uh, to the discussion here. Johannes. Yes, um, as you maybe know, I'm a philosopher. And so I wonder, you said that there's this philosophical idea that people are willing to uh, cooperate uh, within the uh, system of such apps. Uh, where's your underpinning for that? Uh, is, was that like an uh, empirical survey or, or was that just a uh, based on on philosophical research i found that interesting um, it was not empirical research it was just a philosophical observation um, that i based my research on um, though the studies that i presented as well uh, the, re the surveys done by the uh, fundamentals right the agency of the eu and the ocd showed an actual very different uh, aspect of uh, of the same, of the same, of the same angle. So um, you 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 start at a point that we think everyone wants to help each other, that but then in actual practice you realize that people actually are more um, careful with what data they share and how they trust the governments and um, app developers, etc. Okay, um, thank you very much. In, um, in in view of the time, I would like to uh, to continue, uh, move on to the next speaker, and and mind you that at the end of the session we will have opportunity for the audience to ask questions to um, to all the presenters. So um, um, uh, ponder about questions and um, uh, field them in in the comments. Thank you very much, Aista. I, I think it's a bit weird if we start applauding now in in in, a, in an online session. So, but there is a virtual applause in the audience. I can hear it from here. Um, so let's move um, to, to our second speaker, uh, Ludovica Passeri. Um, Ludovica is a PhD student in the um, sort of the predecessor of the program that ISTE is in, the last JD uh, program. And um, that was an Erasmus Mundus uh, program uh, run by um, multiple universities, um, um, also including Tilburg University, where I'm from uh, at the time. Um, and um, um, Ludovica is going to talk about data collection in times of COVID, also through, I presume, um, COVID tracing apps and, and how that impacts uh, public del deliberation and decision making, uh, and then related, uh, relating that, all of that to the GDPR. So Ludovica, if you're, if you're ready, then the, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm able to see. Perfect. Uh, good morning to everyone, and thank you, Professor, for the introduction. In my paper, uh, entitled COVID-19 Pandemic and GDPR, When Scientific Research uh, Becomes a Matter of Public uh, Deliberation, I was interested uh, in the analysis of the relationship between uh, science, scientific research, uh, and uh, uh, the concept of a, uh, public uh, deliberation in the context of COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic. Um, 
This is uh, the outline of my presentation uh, to indicate the direction I intend to follow, uh, considering that uh, what I wondered was if uh, in the European Union there was a legal framework for data protection that would allow uh, scientific knowledge to become um, the basis for public uh, deliberation and uh, subsequently for political decision making. Uh, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic uh, almost uh, as uh, a case study. Um, regarding the scenario from the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was uh, clear that data played a key role. Uh, it was all about data. It's uh, all about data. So much so that some have talked about uh, infodemic. Uh, in my study, in particular, I focused on how these data are used to become scientific knowledge. Uh, and if the data uh, is so important, uh, then as a consequence, paying attention to the governance of these data becomes crucial. Um, it's very important in this regard that the European data strategy, a European strategy for data, um, the uh, communication released by the European Commission on February 2020. Um, why is it relevant? Well, it's relevant for many reasons, but for our reasoning, uh, for two reasons in particular. Um, first of all, because the year 2020 was the symbolic year in which uh, political decisions uh, had to be granted also in scientific knowledge. Uh, and the second reason is that uh, um, this strategy, uh, the European strategy for data, uh, has in some way institutionalized uh, the concept of uh, open science, the paradigm of open science, which I will define uh, soon. Uh, why scientific knowledge uh, can be or should be uh, considered a basis of public uh, deliberation? Well, in uh, this chart, uh, I represented a process. It starts with uh, um, from the collection of data, uh, such data after the elaboration, uh, the modifications of, uh, of the researchers becomes uh, a scientific evidence. And the third step is represented by the transformation of uh, scientific scientific evidence into scientific knowledge as validated by the scientific community. Then this scientific knowledge becomes or should become um, the basis for public deliberation, where public deliberation um, means a space in which it's possible to realize a critical debate, a critical assessment about a problematic issue, taking into account different solutions, different perspectives, each one supported by their justifications, um, following a rational reasoning. Uh, then, um, finally, uh, only at the end of the public uh, deliberation, it comes the political decision. Uh, so the decision taken, adopted uh, by politics. Um, in this way, the scientific knowledge uh, um, seems to represent a sort of interface uh, between uh, um, the world, uh, the field of uh, science, uh, and the field of uh, politics. Um, so it means that the scientific knowledge and uh, its diffusion is uh, crucial uh, in, in this context. Uh, I decided to avoid to investigate the quality or the efficiency of the political decision uh, taken to face uh, the emergency. Um, but uh, I did wonder about the institutional process, uh, uh, specifically the public deliberation and the dissemination of, uh, of scientific knowledge and the impact of, G of the GDPR on it. Um, well, considering uh, that the data is uh, fundamental, uh, uh, I took into account the European data strategy. Uh, as I said before, it's a very relevant uh, communication of the European Commission released in uh, last February, so in February 2020, uh, that aims to design uh, data governance for the European Union. Uh, it provides uh, um, the identification of nine uh, so-called common European data spaces in strategic sectors. Um, and the last part of this strategy is devoted to the European Open Science Cloud. 
what is uh, the European Open Science Cloud? Well, it's uh, a trusted environment uh, for the benefit uh, of uh, European researchers, uh, um, universities, uh, and uh, research centers with the aim to foster as much as possible sharing and reuse of scientific data. Um, we can uh, therefore say that uh, the strategy, so the, the European data strategy, of which the European Open Science Cloud is a part of, um, is a sort of institutionalization of the open science paradigm, of the open science concept. And with the term open science, I refer to a new way uh, of conducting uh, science, uh, scientific uh, research, uh, driven by the, uh, the digital revolution, so the use of ICTs, information and communication technologies uh, in the field of science. Uh, in general, we can say that uh, um, the open science, it consists in the open of every phase uh, of the research cycle, um, but it's not an absolute openness. Uh, it follows the formula as, uh, op uh, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, because the aim is to obtain a more open, global and uh, collaborative research um, that is closely related to the, to the society. Uh, at this point, uh, it might seem that uh, the open science and the data protection uh, uh, go in two opposite, uh, two different uh, directions. Uh, but it is not so. And uh, in, uh, in my analysis, I tried to argue this convergence by identifying uh, three arguments, three main arguments. Uh, first of all, um, I would say that if the, the protection of personal data is ensured in a fundamental right, uh, very important, such as uh, the Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, uh, on the other hand, uh, connected to the open science, uh, there is also a fundamental right uh, ensured in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is the free flow of knowledge. Uh, so, uh, after framing uh, these two concepts uh, within the fundamental rights framework, um, the reasons supporting uh, their convergence uh, are essentially three, in, uh, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, uh, science has, uh, has always been based on the sharing of uh, ideas. Um, and the GDPR recognizes uh, its specific nature, this specific nature, providing a set of derogations uh, specifically related to the field of, uh, of the scientific research. Um, secondly, um, the particular situation uh, determined by the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, determined, uh, demonstrate, uh, demonstrated that the openness of research data uh, and of, of the results of the research data, uh, it, it's feasible. It's feasible, uh, as shown in a tutorial published uh, in, uh, in Nature in February 2020, so um, almost one year ago. And uh, third, uh, um, in, uh, in the paper, I tried to analyze um, the impact of the recent uh, European Court of Justice ruling uh, uh, the so called Schrems 2, because uh, uh, although it refers uh, uh, to the transfer of data for commercial purposes, uh, I think uh, it has an impact, um, a, a considerable impact uh, on the entire European uh, data protection uh, architecture. So for this reason, um, having for scientific research uh, an environment like uh, the European Open Science Cloud um, is uh, a concrete representation uh, of the convergence between uh, the data protection and the free flow of, of, of knowledge. Um, obviously, the road uh, to the implementation of the European Open Science Cloud um, that helps uh, the development of the scientific knowledge as a basis of public uh, deliberation, that is also able uh, um, to guarantee fundamental rights of the European citizens, is not free of challenges. I have identified three macro uh, issues. The first one is related to the general uh, legal framework. 
Uh, this because uh, also the European data strategy seems to make a clear distinction between personal and non-personal data, uh, which, by the way, have two different disciplines, uh, um, the, the former so personal data in the GDPR and uh, non-personal data in the regulation uh, on the free flow of uh, non-personal data. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, in the field of scientific research, uh, it's not so easy to have a perfect distinction between uh, personal and non-personal data. So this could create a considerable problems uh, over, over coordination uh, in the actual implementation. Uh, the second one is related to the fragmentation uh, that uh, characterizes uh, um, the European discipline uh, of the scientific research with the, the great uh, discretion of, of member states in this, uh, in this area, in this domain. Uh, and the third uh, of an issue uh, I have analyzed uh, is related to the strict compliance uh, because uh, all the scientific, uh, no, uh, sorry, scientific research um, enjoys a considerable uh, space of autonomy, as I said, uh, it's uh, still uh, essential um, that the rights of the, of the data subjects, uh, more generally of citizens, um, are maintained, guaranteed uh, in the processing of personal data for scientific research purposes, uh, as also uh, emphasized uh, by the European Data Protection Supervisor in the opinion uh, number three of, of 2020. Um, um, to sum up, uh, the aim of my study was uh, to uh, consider the impact of the GDPR in the scenario of COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the sharing and reuse of research data. Um, taking into account the new European data strategy uh, and its institutionalization of the open science paradigm um, through the, the building, the construction of the European Open Science Cloud. In addition, the context of COVID-19 pandemic made even more clear, more evident that uh, sharing and reuse of research data um, represent or should represent the basis of a public deliberation and the subsequent political decision uh, thanks to, the, to the, the interface represented by the scientific knowledge and uh, the, the dissemination of the scientific knowledge. So this analysis has led to argue that the free flow of knowledge and the data protection are convergent uh, to the extent that uh, we will be able to address uh, the challenges uh, that exist uh, without uh, underestimating them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ludovica. That was um, that was a clear analysis and presentation of the um, sort of the legal framework. Uh, of um, data collection and scientific data collection and the transfer of that into uh, into information for deliberation and uh, and and political decision making in in light of the GDPR and and it's um, so what you've made clear is that uh, those regimes are uh, sort of compatible or at least not incompatible um, and I know it, this is a legal analysis but can you say anything uh, about how um, how things work in practice in the sense, it, have you witnessed um, sort of data becoming more public about uh, that is um, uh, used for, for deliberation and decision making in uh, in COVID time? So you can, you can think about vaccination info. So there's a lot of information available about the vaccines and how they're composed, etc. Um, there might be uh, information available about infection rates here and there, etc. Uh, but that's that's all aggregated data. Have you seen any any sort of movements in 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 uh, in become more data becoming available for for analysis, deliberation, etc. Uh, that's a, a very interesting question because uh, um, there is a debate uh, among scholars uh, about uh, the convergence, the possible compatibility between uh, the two legal regime, uh, regimes, so the open science regimes, uh, uh, the openness of data and uh, uh, the data protection regime. And I focus on it. But uh, abs uh, it's absolut absolutely true that uh, uh, there's also debate about the uh, practical uh, uh, realization of the, of the open science 
science of the openness of data. Um, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, open issues uh, uh, considering the methodologies uh, and uh, the, the practical implementation. Uh, the Open Science Cloud it's, uh, is at the beginning of its, uh, of its life. <laughs> um, so, well, um, the COVID-19 pandemic is a scenario that helps to, um, to promote this, this direction with benefit and with uh, some challenges to face, obviously. Um, but from a legal point of view, we can say that we have uh, the basis to, to go uh, in this direction. Yeah. Okay, people, uh, we have um, a, a question coming in. Ludovico, can you see the question? Uh, no, um, I'm not able. Okay, then, um, so what about sharing data beyond the research context and beyond health? What about sharing employees' data of a multinational across the world? How does this look like or not under EU data, uh, under the EU data strategy? I think this question goes a little bit beyond um, the, the scope of the panel, but maybe you have, you can, say um, a little bit about this um, and, and then maybe think about it for, for um, the, the, the final discussion round. Uh, yes, well, um, the GDPR provides a set of derogations specifically related to uh, the scientific research. So the scientific research uh, as a, 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 um, um, th there is a flexible uh, um, regime for scientific reason, re uh, research, but the reason is, uh, uh, is in, in the purpose, so the purpose of scientific research. The openness, uh, the, the openness for scientific research um, has a sort of uh, uh, um, strong regime for it. Uh, if you consider other type of data, uh, the situation is uh, quite uh, not uh, compatible with the GDPR, or at least it's uh, uh, more difficult to find a way to uh, to deal with uh, with this kind of openness. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Okay, um, thank you very much. I, I would like the, uh, to ask the, uh, the person who asked the question in the chat to elaborate a little bit on that for maybe the, the final round of yes. the conversation. But there's a, there's a whole world opened up by, by this um, um, uh, by this question that we can't go into uh, at this stage um we're going to move on and we're going to 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 take a broader perspective and and look at the uh, the effects that um things like contact tracing apps and other things that are used for for healthcare purposes uh, may have and uh one Chu Kong is going to talk about um how um we may already have seen um, uses in the form of population control and surveillance in, in, in China. And Wan Xu Kong is a Max Weber postdoc fellow at the European Euro University Institute in, in Florence. And if she's ready, then uh, please take the floor. Sure. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Ronald for the introduction. My paper is my paper is essentially a case study of this uh, smartphone app called the health code, which have been used in China since February uh, 2020, so about a year ago, for dealing with the COVID-19. Uh, here is the outline of the paper. Uh, so before I move into the contents of the, uh, of the presentation, just a quick uh, methodological caveat. Uh, so due to obvious reasons, I wasn't able to carry out uh, comprehensive field work in China, so the analysis is largely based on official documents, uh, information released by government in uh, um, uh, uh, news conferences and uh, uh, news media reports since mid-January to mid-July last year. Uh, the objective of this paper is just to initiate a socially informed understanding and critique about the, co uh, about the health code. And of course, uh, further empirical research is needed to further uh, explore uh, its nuances and complexities. Uh, now, just a very brief uh, contextualization of the health code. Uh, in the paper, I explained several demands caused by the pandemic that had uh, paved the way for the rollout of health code in China. Uh, very briefly, uh, the health code is a response to two different but closely, but closely related uh, approaches to pandemic control. 
Uh, one is mass mobilization, and the other is so-called scientific epidemic control. Uh, and obviously, there are so, sort of a contradictions or tensions between these two approaches. So part of the way that the Chinese government handled this uh, was to uh, was by resorting to digital technologies and big data to detect and monitor the spread of the virus. And the health code is so far the most widely used technology during the pandemic. Um, so we'll move to the functionality and te technical specificity of the health code. So basically the program uses big data uh, to analyze people's risk level and assign different colors to people. Uh, the program uses information collected both from individual users and from public services. Uh, the colors correspond to different risk level. So for example, the orange uh, or the red code would mean that the person needed to be confined for one week or two weeks respectively. Uh, the colors also change in real time along with uh, uh, the dynamic risk assessments. Uh, then once registered on the health code, then uh, people are required to display and scan uh, the health code when going to public spaces or taking public transport. Uh, the main technical feature of the health code is that uh, it uses big data analytics. So unlike contact tracing app that use the Bluetooth, uh, which is more commonly, commonly seen in Europe, the health code doesn't really tell you if you have had a close contact with someone having the coronavirus but calculates the probability of uh, close contact based on which then you calculate the risk level. And as we know that this sort of probabilistic knowledge is very difficult to falsify, um, especially if we don't know the source of the data, the quality of the data and the hypothesis underpinning the program, um, which is the case for the Chinese health code. So, uh, it is not surprising that so far there is no efficacy assessment about it, at least to my knowledge. So no studies about uh, its accuracy or how exactly it contributes to the Chinese uh, anti-COVID uh, effort. So this, of course, raises many critical questions about the accountability of algorithm, the legality and legitimacy of forcing people to use the health code, and especially um, as the health code, uh, in fact, imposes restrictions on people's movement. And obviously, there are questions related to data protection and privacy, which is critically important. But these are also uh, uh, similar problems that contact tracing apps in the West have encountered. Uh, ultimately, the question, uh, there is an ultimate question about the whole hype of the so-called techno uh, solutionism in our response to COVID. But, uh, the lack of efficacy proof doesn't really prevent the adoption of health code at all in China. So just to give you a sense of its scale, so in early March last year, Tencent published some, statistic, uh, some statistics. Uh, its health code was scanned for more than 1.6 billion times, covering 900 million people. And by mid-May, it was scanned for 9 billion times. Uh, so I think uh, we can't just consider its usefulness in terms of scientific validity, but consider how it is actually uh, used in practice. Um, so in actual practice, we can observe that the health code is closely tied to the transformation of regulatory and disciplinary power uh, in various public and private entities, so ranging from schools to companies to residential communities uh, to governmental agencies while well, the co pandemic control is just really just an entry point. Uh, through the, mm, the assignation of different colors, uh, the health code produces certain uh, legibility and the actionable knowledge about not just the situation of the COVID, but the society and population more generally. Uh, this effect of technological, uh, this kind of a nexus between power and knowledge has been uh, well explored in science and technology studies literature. Uh, and in China, the health code is remarkable, isn't a re remarkable example of the so-called uh, technological empowerment, which is a very popular discourse in Chinese policy and scholarly uh, discussions. And it really shows the, uh, the kind of paternalistic undertone of this uh, discourse. Uh, the health code empowers traditional forms of governance and disciplinary power 
uh, which further mixes mass surveillance and the provision of basic social and public services. Um, now it comes to uh, the third part of the paper where I discuss the legal and the political conditions of the health code. So uh, in terms of the political conditions, I look at two types of power dynamics. First, it's uh, the public-private relationship. And the second is the central and local relationship. Um, with respect to the first one, the public-private relationship, it is probably a cliche now to say that private companies have played a major role. Uh, the health code was first created by Alibaba and Tessent and first used in Hangzhou and Shenzhen, which are the uh, home bases for these two companies. They were in fact approached by the local government in early February to design an app to help the cities manage uh, returning workers. Not only did these two companies lead the technical uh, development of the health code, uh, they also played a huge role in standard setting in both the local and national level. So the table I show here, uh, sorry that I didn't translate it, but just to show you that both the, uh, the two companies were involved in national level standard setting processes for uh, the health code. So obviously uh, the two private commercial platforms are exercising uh, significant regulatory powers by both uh, de facto regulating people's activities and movements and at the same time in, uh, engaging in policy and lawmaking processes. Uh, there has been a very similar trend in the West regarding the regulatory power of Google and Apple in the COVID context. Um, now with respect to uh, the central and local relationship is actually quite interesting. So very often uh, when we hear about the, the health code in China, we would assume it's like the contact tracing app uh, most uh, widely used in China. But in fact, uh, I'll claim this, uh, in China, there is not a single health code, but multiple ones based on jurisdictions. And the situation uh, of this sort of proliferation of uh, the health code is uh, actually a result of this uh, central local relationship. Um, while the central government set the overarching objectives and approaches to pandemic control, uh, it was really the local government who then decided uh, whether and how to use te uh, digital technologies and uh, what technologies uh, they want to use. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the health code was initially a city-led experimentation by which uh, local government collaborated with private uh, companies and soon got introduced in other cities and provinces who were all under extremely severe political pressure to control the pandemic. And from these two figures, we can see that the majority of local uh, health codes were rolled out from mid-February to early March last year in quite an astonishing speed. Uh, in this whole process of um, introducing the health codes throughout the country, the central government was largely hands-off. Uh, the local-led experimentation on the health code was actually pretty messy. So because different locales had different levels of health emergency, different quantity and quality of data, different methodology of risk assessment. The health code uh, of different locales were, uh, for, for, uh, for quite a long time, they were only valid in their own uh, jurisdictions. It was again the local government who started signing agreements with each other to recognize their health code among themselves. But then starting from mid-March, uh, so roughly uh, a month after the initial creation of the health code, the central government designed a mechanism for cross-region recognition of the health code. But even till now, uh, China has not re achieved really a nationally uniform health code system, essentially due to the difficulty, uh, difficulties of deeper and wider uh, level of data sharing across different departments and regions uh, of the government. Uh, to sum up, with respect to the power dynamics surrounding health, health code, we can observe a heightened level of experimental and entrepreneurial uh, spirit of the local authorities, which then converge with the interest of private companies. Uh, central government had largely a hands-off attitude, and when it wanted to intervene, it was difficult really to catch up with actual practice. Um, this is also reflected by the way the local government have been actually pushing to expand the health code function and continue using it after the pandemic. 
Um, uh, now, what's of course not really missing in this whole story about health code is indeed the law. So the out of sync between law and technology is made quite striking in this case of health code. Uh, but then there are some important signals of law catching up in China. So most importantly, the adoption of uh, China's civil code on May 28, 2020, which uh, contains certain provision on privacy and personal information protection. Uh, recently, China also had this uh, uh, draft law on personal information protection that is now current, uh, that is currently under deliberation at the um, uh, National People's Congress. So for now, um, I, I think it's premature to say what effect this legislative moves would uh, eventually produce. My impression is that the frame of privacy and data protection is important, but it has the risk of being co-opted or hijacked by both uh, big techs and governments. After all, um, it is uh, not difficult to imagine big uh, brothers claim themselves to be a diligent fiduciary of personal data. Uh, so to conclude, um, every technology is socially conditioned and socially embedded. So, so is the health code and it differs remarkably from the contact tracing apps designed by Google and Apple. Uh, it's swift and wide um, development, deployment and normalization in China are a result of multiple factors. The COVID is a kind of external shock, but there have been many pre-existing conditions such as the commitment of the government to, data, uh, to datafication and informatization of the society and state governments. Um, and, the chain, and, and also the Chinese digital platform have been closely integrated in uh, public administration. The health code uh, enhances disciplinary power of both public and private authorities, but at the same time is subject to and conditioned by various power relations and become relatively unruly. Uh, while this unruly situation has pushed the new legislative efforts to regulate the health code and to better protect individual privacy, uh, such efforts do not address uh, fundamentally the, te the techno solutionist assumption of the health code and its implication for uh, state power. And I'll end my presentation here. Okay, uh, th thank you, Wanchu, for this um, for, for this wonderful overview of uh, developments in, in in China. If if I get it correctly, then the uh, the original um, sort of application, in any case, uh, doesn't rely on Bluetooth pro proximity monitoring, but is rather tries to predict uh, the, the the risk that an individual runs uh, on the basis of probabilistic inferences of both the behavior of the individual and, and other data sources. And on the basis of that, you get, um, you get sort of signals in, in terms of colors of how to behave. So, the, and, and of course, this is an empirical question, but, but doesn't this, and you, re, in, um, you refer to that in, in, in a sense that, that um, it, it's a very opaque system. And it indeed uh, allows government basically to uh, to to uh, um, to manipulate um, uh, individual behavior um, with not too much accountability. Is is that um, it, and that is of course the fear that many people have with COVID tracing apps in the, in the first place. Is is that um, would you go as far as that? As, as so, no. What is your perspective on on that in 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 the uh, the Chinese context? Is is that actually how it's no, open question. Sorry, I have to do open questions. Um, so, if I just I could reframe uh, what you were saying. So, indeed, there is a, a really huge level of opacity in terms of how these colors, uh, how the risk levels were calculated, and how the colors are designed. And uh, from social media, actually, you can find tons of stories about people just sort of trying to guess what exactly is happening behind it. And there are also rumors about, for example, oh, maybe the code will change from green to yellow or to uh, or to red just because I visit, uh, you know, a, a, a fever clinic or just because I buy a certain medicine from the pharmacy. So there are a lot of rumors and guesses by people, which really indicate the opacity of the program. Uh, but whether whether it really um, 
uh, sort of allow the government to manipulate the people's behavior. To a certain extent, I think, yes. But at the same time, it's not just the gov for governmental authorities to manipulate people's uh, behavior and activities. Uh, we can say from a sort of Foucauldian perspective and how the power, disciplinary power is related through all sorts of social encounters. And this is what happened in China with the health code. Once you actually need to scan it when you take a public transport, when you uh, enter a restaurant or a shopping mall, and if you don't show the yellow, uh, the, the green code, you're not allowed to enter. And it's not uh, uh, a kind of power exercised directly by the government, but it's through peers, sure, through yeah. um, uh, just private entities as well. So, so to follow up questions then, do people observe the, uh, the color code? So if they get a red code, do they stay indoors? And, and uh, uh, the other one is that if you have to show a green code, um, you could borrow somebody else's phone that has um, a green code and, and enter the, the restaurant while you actually yourself have yellow or red. Uh, yeah, well, uh, in terms of enforcement, the, uh, from the information that I gathered, it's actually pretty strict because uh, the idea is that all this information will be shared in real time with uh, the local uh, anti-COVID anti staff. So once uh, you, you get a, a red code and then those staff, they will come, uh, they'll, they'll pay a uh, home visit to you every day just to check you're actually uh, you actually stay at home. You don't. You don't go out. And of course, they, they do the home checks not just to make sure that you are actually confined. Uh, they also bring essential uh, services like uh, in certain uh, in certain area when a whole district is uh, under lockdown, they actually have to bring food to you, and they they probably will also check your you know the mental health. So they will give you some mental health counseling. They would even bring uh, about medicine to you. So this is a kind of, you know, the mixture of surveillance and provision of yeah, uh, yeah. social services that I, I was uh, uh, indicating. But in terms of, yeah, like uh, what about people gaming the system? And I think uh, our Chinese people are, of course, not the only say, uh, people that like great game, uh, gaming the system. But, and, and indeed, uh, I mean, like, uh, technically, uh, perhaps you can indeed enter, you know, public spaces or public transport with the phone of someone else. But the idea is, of course, all those uh, software, they have real, real name registration. And so you scan the code when going to a restaurant. Also, the, basically, the, res the restaurant would have a record of who actually scanned it. So the res restaurant wouldn't yeah. uh, take the responsibility if someone got uh, detected, um, but but indeed, you know, like this kind of techno uh, solutionism always there are loopholes. So people, what about people who just don't have uh, a smartphone or people can't use uh, the, the the app? And there there are definitely issues about it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, I'm afraid we have to move on um, just for, for the audience. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the papers are, avail are available. So, do, if you want to read them, contact the authors. And then, of course, this is not the end of it. Uh, every year we produce uh, the CPDP um, volume and authors are invited to, to, um, uh, to improve their paper and, and submit it for um, um, consideration of inclusion in in the in the, um, uh, in the volume, so uh, many of the papers that you will uh, hear today will uh, will likely end up in the, um, uh, the CPD volume, which will become available um, at the next conference. So there's always this cliffhanger. Okay, finally, the final paper is um, is is. Um, is uh, following up a little bit on, on on this to some extent. So it is um, it's a paper delivered by Johannes uh, Thumfart, um, and it's um, it's about how COVID may have sort of at, at least that's my interpretation of it um, sounded the bell for the next stage in the development of digital sovereignty. Um, Johannes is a senior researcher at L LSTS uh, in Brussels, but at the moment he's in Berlin, but I'm now disclosing sort of personal uh, data, which I shouldn't. So um, the floor is yours, uh, Johannes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to talk uh, after such wonderful presentations. And uh, 
Yeah, here's my slides, uh, which are going up. Um, I'm talking about the COVID crisis as catalyst for digit O. Oh, now my slides are kind of uh, going too far. Okay, that's fine. Um, the COVID crisis as catalyst for digital sovereignty. Uh, and you can see this paper later on also uh, on academia.edu and SSRN. I will put it up there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if we look at the COVID crisis, we see three major effects of the COVID crisis. Uh, we see an increase of practices of bordering, of course, lockdowns of nations and regions, export embargoes on health products. We see second, securitization, restrictions of civil liberties, emphasis on national security. And uh, we see third, digitalization, of course, online shopping, home office, contact tracing, and so on. And when we look at uh, digital sovereignty, then we see uh, uh, digital sovereignty is really at the intersection of these uh, three effects of the COVID crisis, practices of bordering, digitalization and securitization. And uh, digital sovereignty, so what is it? Uh, there were several panels on this uh, in this conference. Uh, I would say it's a developing contested concept described by a number of similar terms in a number of different contexts. We have technological sovereignty, internet sovereignty, data sovereignty. We have in France, souveraineté numérique. We have in Germany, digitale souveraineté. In China, we have network sovereignty and information sovereignty, among others. And in Russia, we have the sovereign internet. Those terms are not identical, but they are related. And uh, when we look at the key aspects of digital sovereignty, then we see the most important aspect is statism, like digital statism. Digital sovereignty implies national control over digital technologies and their impact. Um, a second uh, trace would be digital emancipation. In democracies legitimized by popular sovereignty, this indirectly includes personal control of digital technologies. Yeah, so, can, for example, it's it's important to note here that digital sovereignty is not a, a state-only concept, but it's uh, it can be emancipatory. But we also have digital bordering. In all nations, this includes attempts to align cyberspace with the territory of a state, for example, by data localization, by a applying local laws in general, and uh, for example, privacy laws. A defining conflict here is private versus public sector. Are private companies, for example, GAFAM, Twitter, and others, competitors of the state regarding digital sovereignty? And what about public-private partnerships? Um, yeah, historically, the notion of digital sovereignty can be traced back to China. Its defining features are anti-imperialism and illiberalism. One of the first texts on information sovereignty from 1998 clearly describes the concept in opposition to U.S. digital neocolonialism. That's, of course, a, a Marxist-inspired uh, critique by, uh, of, of imperialism. I quote, whilst the information superpowers sing the hymns of international freedom of communication and information without borders, many developing countries feel that their rights are being taken away and even their national security is being threatened. Written by Wing Shang Go, an international relations scholar in 1998. That is very early uh, in the West. We will not have such reasoning until like 20 years later. Uh, when we look at the history of digital sovereignty, we uh, see, uh, I, I developed that for that paper, there are these four stages of uh, norm development. And the uh, first stage goes from 1998 to 2012. And China is here the prime norm entrepreneur. Um, and I would say prime, uh, China's actions are due to um, the, the, a catalytic event. And that's US surveillance within Echelon and within the Patriot Act and within PRISM. And what China is doing, it installs the golden shield domestically, but it also uh, pursues internationally an agenda of uh, digital sovereignty via the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the World Summit on the Information Society from 2002 to 2005. Uh, the stack, a second stage would be initiated by the Snowden revelations, and that goes from 2013 to 2016. What happens here is that uh, the EU and Russia join uh, China in its endeavor for digital sovereignty. Uh, Russia is developing its sovereign internet, the EU is developing the GDPR and tries to position itself as a regulatory superpower, and China continues 
its quest for digital sovereignty uh, with the digital Silk Road, but also with the World Internet Conference starting in 2014. Uh, the third stage is initiated by a US general election and Brexit in 2016. And that's the stage of norm universalization. Why is it the stage of norm universalization? Because like the West, namely the US, realize that they are also vulnerable to digital intrusion. Uh, private platforms acted as spreaders of hostile political propaganda and they are a uh, cause for regulation from the civil society, but also from public sec, uh, from uh, the uh, political actors. And the next stage will be the stage of uh, norm internalization during the COVID crisis 2020 to 21. And I will talk a little bit uh, about what is happening there. Uh, COVID related instruments of digital sovereignty are contact tracing, digitalization of bureaucracies, moderation of undesired digital contact, uh, content uh, for fighting the disinfodemic in democracies and censorship in authoritarian regimes. Um, also, an economic bordering due to national security issues is important here. Um, uh, we, uh, at the ideological level, the COVID crisis is a crisis of liberalism. States of emergency favor illiberal modes of governing. If securitization means suspending the liberal pluralistic mode of governing, then illiberal regimes are naturally better at it. Individual rights pose no obstacle to them. Why isn't COVID Chinese communism? Chernobyl, that's something to be discussed, but is it the Chernobyl of global liberalism? Spoiler, no, it isn't. Why is that not so? Because there's also the bottom-up implementation of digital sovereignty, which is characteristic to this phase of norm internalization. There's an enduring increased utilization of digital services by civil society beyond the crisis, for example, shopping, learning, working. Uh, and therefore, states are confronted with higher output expectations regarding privacy, security and convenience. Popular digital sovereignty also plays a role through comparative governance online, for example, via the Johns Hopkins University dashboard. Uh, this leads to increased digital accountability of governments, and that is possibly emancipatory. Um, in the US, we have Trump's failed digital sovereignism. Hence, there's no general turn to authoritarianism. In uh, summer 2020, uh, Trump attempted a ban of TikTok and WeChat, and the US State Department issued this Clean Network initiative in order to exclude Chinese tech firms, uh, which is legitimized by COVID and security concerns. In winter 2020, Trump banned, uh, was banned by US digital platforms. Yeah, so the question is here, who is digital sovereign states? or digital platforms? That's the question in the US. Um, uh, in the EU, we have a hawkish rhetoric of digital sovereignty. I quote here an ideas paper by the Euro European Parliament Research Service from July 2020. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic showed the essential role played by the high-tech sector and has accelerated a reflection on the need for sovereign digital technologies, end of quote. And in September 2020, von der Leyen said when announcing the EU recovery plan investments in digital infrastructure projects, for example, Gaia-X, uh, none of this is an end in itself. It is about Europe's digital sovereignty on a small and large scale. Uh, so. The EU's reality is a little bit more complex than that, of course. There are discussions of actual or virtual exclusion of Huawei and CTE in 5G development, but so far only the UK, which is not a EU state anymore, and Sweden have explicit bans. Such a ban is in conflict with uh, World Trade Organization free trade rules and the EU industry's export interests. Um, EU's digital sovereignty flagship Gaia-X is also marketed as a sovereign cloud. However, since October 2020, uh, Chinese and US companies can be involved, uh, but they cannot become board members. Uh, the EU is therefore accused of sovereignty washing. Yeah, the conclusion would be that we have regional variations of digital sovereignty, which is here heavily simplified. China has a statist, a liberal idea with an international agenda. Uh, 
for example, via the ITU. I, I think we have seen in one shoot's presentation very well that uh, this is a simplified view. And, and in fact, we have a complex interaction in China between uh, public and private sector, but still the public sector is the dominating one. Uh, in the US, uh, we have private platform sovereignty and Trump digital sovereignism failed and in the EU there's this weighing versus uh, political versus export driven interest for example regarding 5G and Gaia X. Uh, only the member states are sovereign in the EU and we can see that very well. Uh, sovereignism where it hurts is usually taxation and uh, France, uh, France brought about this digital services tax and that lead really to conflicts with the US uh, that was like a, a exertion of sovereignty that was kind of strong. And uh, the question is also what about the sovereignism leaning Visegrad states uh, should, such as Poland. Poland is just discussing uh, preservation of free speech law in order to prevent digital platforms from uh, banning content that is not illegal in Poland. Uh, so that would that's also something to watch what will happen there. In Russia we have famously the sovereign internet which has been reportedly disconnected in 2019. Uh, it, there's the, the idea of sovereignty that's behind this goes back to Karl Schmidt, which is read a lot in uh, Russia, especially around Putin, uh, especially like the pan-Slavic uh, theorists. And th that idea is like realized here that the sovereign is who decides about the state of exception. And the state of exception would be like really to disconnect the internet. However, obviously Russia also has an international agenda. It uh, it uh, spreads digital propaganda abroad, as we know, and it's also a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization together with India and China. Um, yes, thank you for listening and uh, for questions and ideas. Please send me an email. All right. So, thank you, Johannes. I, I found this a fascinating um, overview of, of stages in. in, in, in in developing sovereignty, um, and, and it's um, um, I, I, it resonates a lot. I, 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 I see this internalization that you discuss in the in the final part as the fourth stage, uh, going on everywhere. But my I, um, um, since there are no qu questions in the chat, I'll I'll, I'll use my uh, my role as chair to uh, to ask a question. So so one of the uh, things. So on the one hand, you have, and I'm very fond of this notion of the Brussels effect. You see. You see, for instance, the GDPR ID is spreading around the globe. Um, and so Kenya has adopted uh, the Data Protection Act, which is very, very similar to the GDPR, etc. How does that relate to, to this notion of internalization? So on the one hand, you see the spread of, of sort of a data protection framework. And on the other hand, uh, countries and platforms um, going, yeah, retracting into themselves. Yeah, this uh, process effect is surely something to be discussed here in in the context of internalization. But what I mean really with internalization of digital sovereignty would be more um, the bottom up implementation of digital sovereignty, which means that uh, whilst digital sovereignty has been an abstract issue or an issue uh, related to governments only, it changed to uh, become a popular issue and an issue that relates very much to civil society on a day-to-day -day basis now. And uh, I think uh, that's that's important here that one um, sees internalization really as something that happens in civil society and that sort of naturalizes the idea of uh, digital sovereignty. And the other thing would be a um, naturalization via the international sector. That's anyway something that's important. Digital sovereignty is not uh, closing oneself off and becoming an hermetic island, a digital island, but it is really about uh, about uh, promoting one's own normative understanding of digital sovereignty on the international level. And that's what China is doing. That is what the US is doing with the Clean Network Initiative. And that is uh, also what the EU is doing uh, in a maybe smarter and softer way. But but let's see who uh, who succeeds at the end. 
Yeah, okay, but yes, yeah, so uh, fascinating. And uh, but unfortunately, we, we have to stop here. We get uh, the director telling us that there's one minute and, and probably is going to count down from 30 seconds to zero uh, right now. Um, I want to thank all the, the, the speakers on the panel. Um, I, I found all four presentations fascinating and the topics very, very interesting. And um, I, I would invite all of you to, to go check out the, the comments uh, because there are questions to some of the uh, presenters that you may want to um, uh, get back to. So mingle in the, what, what's the thing uh, called again? The, uh, um, uh, the gather town, um, find, uh, find people, talk to them and, and uh, looking forward to your, uh, your papers in printed form, hopefully in the, in, in the CPDB uh, volume. So, but that will take so, some time. So um, um, our time is up probably. So um, um, it's up to the director. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all very Thank much. And, and looking forward to see you live next year in Brussels again. <laughs>